What is up everyone? How's it going? This is Watch from MW Technology and today I'm going to go through my six month journey on trying to upgrade my existing camera setup. For the past several months I've been buying, testing and selling many used cameras to determine which one has the best bang for the dollar. From Blackmagic, Sony as well as Panasonic, I think I might have found the perfect camera setup for me personally and the one that has the most value. So if you're interested, let's go inside and find out. Now back in 2016, we got our first 4K camera, the Panasonic Lumix G7. And at the time, we actually had a partnership with B&H Photo where we could test out pretty much every camera on the market. And I found that the G7 with its 100 megabit per second, 30 FPS at 4K for under $500 was definitely the most camera that you can get for that price point. And uh, even to this date, now since it's several years old, you can easily pick up a G7 for $250 or less. And uh, given that uh, at the time and even right now, a good camera still costs around two to three thousand dollars, you could buy several G7 bodies. And if you want a camera that never overheats, has still great 4K video capturing capabilities, and nowadays you can pick one up used for two hundred dollars or less, it's definitely a no brainer. But understandably, there are some limitations, even though you can adapt. Uh, the uh, micro four thirds sensor to fit any lens and you can even put a speed booster so it looks like an APS-C or a larger sensor camera. There are some limitations in terms of dynamic range, low light, and obviously lack of stabilization as well as not the great autofocus. So uh, eventually I knew down the road that I'm gonna get a newer camera uh, to fulfill some of my inner needs as a photographer slash cinematographer enthusiast. And I want to get uh, obviously something that has has the same value proposition as the G7, but just with a more modern and more capable image quality. So ideally my new camera would need to have better dynamic range. So something that records beyond 8-bit video, 10-bit, 12-bit would be great. Obviously having a larger sensor would be ideal, especially full frame since I have a lot of full frame lenses and I love that overall look and the shallow depth of field that you can get with a full frame sensor, as well as a flippy screen, good battery life, good audio, et cetera, et cetera. Autofocus is not that important to me because I'm mostly using manual lenses anyways, uh, so uh, that's not a big deal, but I know for some people that might be a concern of theirs, which is going to definitely uh, limit you in terms of the cheaper camera options that might not have the best autofocus, but have good overall image quality. Now, the first uh, camera that I started out with was a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K. You can easily pick these up, uh, quite affordable these days, under $800, $700, especially since they've been around for a while. The form factor is great since they're pretty compact. And the best thing about them is definitely the image quality. You can record raw 4K as well as ProRes. Uh, and uh, side by side, even though we're looking at Micro Four Thirds sensor on both my G7 and the Blackmagic, there's a night and day difference between the clarity, sharpness, and the amount of information in the colors. If you're looking for the best skin tones possible, obviously with the color grading flexibility, you can make the Blackmagic look like an Aerie Alexa, a Sony camera, anything you like. Now, what are the downsides? Uh, firstly, in terms of the file sizes themselves, because you're recording RAW or ProRes, you're looking at anywhere between 10 to 20 times the file size as a 100 megabit per second camera like my Panasonic G7. So that's definitely gonna make huge, large file sizes. So data management is going to be an issue with the camera that shoots RAW like the Blackmagic cameras. Additionally, the battery life was pretty terrible in the camera themselves. I would be lucky if I got 15 to 20 minutes and uh, no flippy screen, obviously. So in order to make the camera usable, you're definitely have to rig it out with an external monitor, battery, perhaps uh, SSD drives, and your pocket camera doesn't become a pocket camera at that stage. So eventually after a couple of weeks of testing, I had to let the Blackmagic go and move on. I want to try out some uh, Sony mirrorless full frame cameras. Obviously if I had, um, $3,000 or $4,000, it'd be an obvious answer with the A7S Mark III. It has pretty much all the capabilities you would ever want in a mirrorless full frame camera, uh, but obviously it comes with a price. So I couldn't afford that. I couldn't afford its offshoot variants like the ZV-E1 
because those are still going to be around $1,500 to $2,000 and uh, certainly not the FX3 or any of the other cinema grade cameras. Now, potentially you could get an A7C Mark I, but I couldn't unfortunately find them for under $1,000. What you can definitely get is an A7S Mark II as well as an A7 III. So I want to start out with uh, getting an A7S uh, Mark II because I initially tested it eight years ago and I was pretty impressed with the overall quality. It records 4K 30 FPS at 100 megabits per second. So similar to the G7, it's an 8-bit video and it's a special sensor for low light videography and photos since it has a 12 megapixel full frame readout. Now, since this camera is fairly old, you can pretty much pick them up for almost nothing. I found one for $600 with a whole bunch of accessories. And uh, straight off the bat, I was pretty impressed with the overall value of getting a full frame mirrorless camera from Sony at this price point. Uh, but there are some drawbacks. Uh, obviously, you're looking at 8-bit video, so the dynamic range is fairly poor. Even though it has uh, S-Log3 capabilities, you're gonna be limited in terms of grading because of the 8-bit video files. In addition to that, there's no flippy screen, uh, but you can get this uh, mirror attachment that goes onto the hot shoe and basically reflects um, an image of uh, the articulating screen that's on the back of these first generation A7 cameras. So that's good if you want to look at yourself, but it is kind of a band-aid issue. And to see yourself properly, you're probably gonna have to, again, rig it out with an external monitor and probably an external power source because the battery life on the first generation A7S Mark I, Mark II are pretty terrible with the FW50 batteries, I believe. And in addition to that, just the general color science of the image that you're getting straight off the bat isn't that great. I was never really satisfied with the camera, but since it was so cheap, I did use it for four months uh, on and off uh, with different video projects and uh, was fairly satisfied, but eventually got kind of uh, frustrated with the overall color and images coming out of the camera, especially the skin tones were not that great. So I had to let it go and move on to the A7 III, which is typically about $150 more expensive on the used market I found. And they're readily available since the camera is so popular for both video and still shooters. And uh, the A7 III on paper looks very similar to the A7S Mark II in terms of its video capturing capabilities. Both record 100 megabits per second, 4K, 30 FPS video at 8 bit but the color science is completely different and the overall sharpness is much better on the a7 III because it's using a 6k sensor down sample to 4k so you are going to see more kind of fine sharpness and overall resolution in the image in addition to the better color science skin tones the big thing was also the dual card slots as well as the battery life was much better on the a7 III more similar to the modern day camera since it's using the current generation sony batteries now, after a couple of months of using the A7 III, I did still find some limitations in the fact that it's still 8-bit video. Uh, you don't have any slow motion capturing capabilities or higher 4K capturing capabilities, and you don't have a right flippy screen. Uh, you're still dealing with basically the same ergonomics as the A7S Mark II. So I eventually had to get rid of it and uh, move on uh, to something from potentially Canon. But when I was looking at Canon, uh, there's really not too many options under the $1,000 mark if you want 4K video specifically. Lots of older generation uh, 5Ds uh, available as well as 60s, but uh, they can only record uh, 1080p. And uh, if you really want 4K uh, with uh, no crop, you only have the option right now in the budget area to go with a Canon EOS R8. Those are usually $1,299 brand new and potentially used, you can found them uh, for a thousand dollars, but I really didn't have too many luck because it's a fairly new camera and most people are not selling them in the used market. Now you can get the original EOS R for under a thousand dollars and it can record 4K video, but at a 1.7 times crop on the full frame sensor. So if you want full frame 4K, uh, that's not possible on the OS R, but it is a pretty good 1080p camera, 8-bit, great battery life, and a flippy screen. Uh, but I didn't want to be limited to that 1.7 times crop because what's the point of getting a full frame camera in the first place? So uh, I thought that Canon was definitely not the right option for the time being. And I was pretty much lost at that point. 
And it wasn't until I looked back at my uh, Panasonic G7 and found that what is Panasonic doing right now? I know they make the uh, GH5, GH6, as well as uh, the G9 series of cameras, which are just more powerful, more capable micro four thirds cameras. But I also remember they came out with the S1 and S1H, their first generation full frame cameras. But in 2020, they actually came out with the original S5. And uh, this camera was completely eclipsed by the A7S Mark III, which came out the same time. So most people ignored it. And plus it had contrast detection autofocusing, which again, a lot of people uh, didn't want. And uh, it's not until you look at the other features that it has as 4K 60 FPS, it has uh, 180 frames per second and 1080p slow motion capabilities. You have 10 bit uh, video codecs as well as VLOG capabilities. And the fact that it has a flippy screen, great battery life, and probably the best stabilization on any mirrorless camera is definitely something to look into. And plus, uh, since the introduction of the S5 Mark II and Mark II X, you can find them really cheap in the used market since they've gone down in value quite a bit. So I actually picked one up for under $900 with a cage uh, from small rig as well as an extra battery. Now, as soon as I got the S5, I started testing and fell in love with the image, especially the V-Log uh, color profile with the 10-bit video. You could make it look like a Sony A7S Mark III in the right circumstance, and you're really getting an amazing image straight out of the box with the S5. In addition to that, it has an awesome UI, a great stabilization, which is probably uh, the best in the mirrorless world right now with Panasonic. Great battery life, dual native ISOs, and the best thing of all, a flippy screen like all the Panasonic cameras. Some of the other things that I really like about the camera is that the USB-C connection, if you're doing long video shoots, you can actually power it externally and then it'll charge uh, the camera uh, later. And uh, you could use a USB power bank or connect it to an AC adapter and pretty much have the camera roll without any overheating issues and battery issues. The battery life itself is really great. You can easily get two hours of a video record time with one battery and uh, that's definitely uh, very nice to have, but you effectively have no power constraints when it comes to uh, powering the camera. The other thing that I love is the remote capturing capabilities. If you're using um, a smartphone, iPhone, or Android, you can use the Lumix Sync app and control pretty much every aspect of the camera wirelessly because it has uh, built-in Wi-Fi. And you can also hook it up to a Mac or PC uh, via a tether connection through the USB and also have the same functionality. In addition to that, it has dual card slots and the file management and overall efficiency of the video codec is great. At 150 megabits per second for 4K videos, it's very manageable file sizes and the video looks great. Even the 1080p at 100 megabits per second looks a little bit better than my 4K on the Panasonic G7. Now the S5 is using the Leica L mount and uh, native lenses I have not tried at this point since uh, again, as we mentioned before, I'm mainly using manual focus EF lenses, uh, either from Canon or adapted Nikon glass. I've been doing that for many, many years. So I'm used to just manual focus for a video, uh, but you can actually autofocus with uh, EF lenses. I'm actually using an adapter that has electronic connections for both aperture and uh, autofocusing, uh, but I don't really use the autofocusing in the camera, but, but it does have that capabilities and it is a, of course contrast based, not reliable. But the cool thing is right now with the LiDAR based follow focusing attachments that you can get from companies like PD Movie and DJI, you can actually effectively solve the problem of manual focus uh, if you have a camera body like the S5 that doesn't have built-in good autofocus or if you're using mostly manual lenses. I'm actually testing the PD Movie uh, LiDAR Smart System, which uh, basically is a simple LiDAR-based follow focusing system that gives you the option to either remotely uh, control the focus or use its close distance focusing capabilities. So whichever thing is closest uh, to the sensor, which is uh, mounted right in front of the camera, it'll focus and you calibrate it and so on. But it is fairly reliable for close distance focusing and a usable option if you don't have good autofocus in your camera system. 
Beyond all that, I still think that the Panasonic G7, uh, if you adapt it with the right lenses, speed booster and accessories and have good lighting, is probably still uh, the best camera even to this date in 2024. But if you're looking for a full frame camera under $1,000 that has all these amazing features and most importantly, a great image, the S5 is hard to beat at this point. I definitely love to know what you guys think is the best camera under $1,000. Uh, do you think I made the right decision with the S5? And uh, if you are using any specific camera, I'd love to know what you guys are shooting with, uh, whether it's for stills, videos, YouTube, or anything uh, commercial related. If you haven't done so already, please make sure you subscribe to the channel, have post notifications turned on, and like the video. Check out the description down below for everything we've talked about, and we'll see you real soon in the next one. Take care.